Jim Dater, thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you coming to have Delighted to be here. Thank you. So we're doing a, a, a program today on futurism and futurists. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't want to use the word predictions because prediction <laughs> may not be the exact right word for what you do. Right. Uh, but we thought we would talk to you today as a futurist about the economy and about uh, science and technology, okay. which is a really important connection. Certainly. So I'd like to get your, your, your thoughts on that. But before we go to that, I want to know what a futurist is and what kind of analysis a futurist makes. Okay. Well, um, futurists are frequently misunderstood as being soothsayers or crystal ball gazers or people who can somehow predict the future. I, I try to insist that the word predict means what it says, to say before, mm -hmm. to accurately say what will happen. Mm -hmm. Once upon a time, we lived in a world where that was possible, but not mo anymore. <laughs> uh, what we can do is to forecast, and a forecast is a logical statement, a if-then contingent statement, but it doesn't intend to be true. Of course, it doesn't intend to be false, but rather it attempts to be useful. So we try to make useful statements about the, fu uh, about the futures that are useful to clients, to uh, decision makers uh, in making decisions that will create the future. It's not like and a then, profession. It's almost like a profession. Well, it is a profession. Yeah. Um, I have uh, been at the University of Hawaii at the Hawaii Research Center for Future Studies, which the legislature created mm -hmm. in 1971. Mm -hmm. uh, and through the Department of Political Science, we have been producing people who make their living a very good living as futurists, as consulting futurists. And uh, so if anyone is looking for a job, <laughs> I recommend they come and learn to be a futurist. <laughs> well, you know, one thing that strikes me about being a futurist is you're, you're, you're always at risk that some element, some factor, some, some vector will come in from nowhere and change everything. Well, that's why you don't predict. Because, um, in fact, I'd say it's more than that. Once upon a time, there used to be a notion of a most likely future, of a normal future, of which things would come in once in a while and disrupt. And people would refer to those things often as wild cards, which implies there's unwild cards that make up uh, a normal future. Mm -hmm. uh, in my 40, 50 years of working in uh, the area of future studies, I've long ago realized there is no such thing as a normal future that uh, that's why we can't predict it, because there are always these things coming in, surprising us, upsetting us. Nonetheless, our job as a futurist is to try to look for those things at their earliest possible emergence. We call them emerging issues, mm -hmm. and we contrast them to trends, mm -hmm. which are things that are empirically observable in uh, over time. You know, and, in real estate, uh, in mm -hmm. real estate, there's uh, in, in appraisal of real estate, there are things called comparables. Mm -hmm. And you know, you say, well, this comparable is at X dollars, so that maybe the rent or the, the, the value of this other property is likewise for X dollars. But then you have to adjust. You adjust the comparable in order to reach the value of the, the parcel you're appraising. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like maybe it's a similarity here. As you find an issue, a disruptive issue, and then you give it weight. Yes, and that's you, exactly you make a right. prediction on uh, on how important that is mm -hmm. and how likely is it. And, and well, one of, rather than actually give a weight, um, what we do is create alternative futures, and the the these uh, emerging issues can play more or less greater importance uh, according to different alternative futures, and the alternatives are based upon. First of all, empirical evidence. Over the years, I've collected images of the future, ideas people have, and they fall into four piles. Um, one is called continued growth or continuation. A second is called collapse for whatever reason. A third is called discipline or conserver or now sustainability. And then the fourth is sort of a transformation or a metamorphosis into something unexpected. It's a good metamorphosis or it could be a It could bad be either. None of these are good or bad. They are all neutral from that point of view. And none is supposed to be more likely than the other or better than the other. So what Each is, is equal. What training do you need to have to be a futurist? Well, I, I have a, a list of things called the attributes of a futurist. Yeah, go ahead. And I won't go through the whole list, no, but it basically the, the, requires you to know a little bit about everything and something very well. It's important to have some sort of an academic background, but the futurists come from absolutely all academic disciplines. 
uh, and I happen to be in political science and social science generally, but I spend a lot of time with engineers, with technicians, I work heavily in the space community, and of course that's the highest of all high tech and the most futuristic of all human endeavors. So you, so you educate yourself. I have to educate find an myself. issue that you have to build into your model. You have to learn about that well, issue. Well, what I used to do in the old days before the internet was every Christmas vacation and spring vacation, I would go to the reading room in the library where the journals are, start with A and read to Z in every foreign language. I don't read every foreign language, but you could sort of see what the topics were that were being discussed. So you want to get a handle on the whole world. That's right, and that's, that's a way I did that. Now, I, I don't know things from an insider's point of view, but uh, using that technique uh, and being similarly Catholic in my interest and having a uh, something called deductive uh, forecasting in which from those one of those four models I can deduce the future of anything mm -hmm. uh, I'm able and my students are able to serve uh, as advisors in areas where they really have no academic expertise. So Jim, you know, you've been doing this for, did you say 40 years? I, yes, more than 40 years. Big question. Mm -hmm. Have you been right? Well, I don't try to predict, but you know, now that I've been doing it so long, uh, I have had to go back and look at the, at least, did I talk about the issue? Let me give you an example. When I first came to Hawaii in 1970, we had something called Hawaii 2000. And it was the largest citizen-based uh, activity that's ever happened anywhere in the world, I think, short of actual revolution. It was sponsored by Governor Burns, by the uh, legislature, by the business community, by the labor unions, by the university. Everyone was involved. And uh, we produced a book called Hawaii 2000 that had all of the ideas that we expressed about the future. And we were right on when it came to technology. We predicted the internet, we predicted the iPhone, all of that sort of stuff. That's no problem. That's you can take a look at it and yeah. you'd be uh, amazed at what how. What was the secret that made that Well, we had possible. people that uh, understood something about the, the future of electronic technology at that very primitive state and were able to put things together. We also had people at the uh, Biomed who talked about genetic engineering and that sort of stuff. But you know what we missed? 100% was the social issues. Uh, even though women's liberation was then in full uh, flower, everyone who participated, and they're all listed, all of the married women are listed by their husband's name. They're Mrs. John Doe. They're not themselves. More importantly than that, we missed the entire Hawaiian Renaissance. Even though we had excellent representation from the Hawaiian community, they were in agreement that Hawaiians were just going to fade but away. Doesn't, isn't it work, though? That, <clears throat> for me, it works. It's science, you know, is you, you, you have certain expectations, you draw a projection, you can figure it out, but you can't figure out humanity. It's you much, much, much harder. more difficult. Much, much harder. Yeah, There's no yeah. doubt about it. And that, of course, is what really matters in sure. the long run. Sure. Good people change everything. Right. So, so now moving to our, the subject of okay. the day. Uh, we agreed that we would we'd talk today about your analysis of, um, of the economy right. and linked with science and technology, Certainly. which is our main area of coverage. Certainly. So can, can you tell me uh, what your thoughts are about those fields and how they relate and okay. what's going to happen or your let analysis me, about Let me put happen. it in a little historical <laughs> because we always talk about the future and the, the past and the present before we talk about the future. When I came to Hawaii, um, I was very much a high-tech optimist. Uh, I really felt that, uh, that in Hawaii and the world in general, uh, we were headed towards a, a social transformation, mm -hmm. somewhat along the lines of Kurt, uh, Ray Kurzweil, if you're familiar sure. with his concept of the singularity. I was very much that kind of a guy. However, I gave a talk uh, before the joint session of the Hawaii State Legislature in 1970, when uh, I not only talked about these high-tech things, I said that we, however, have a number of important problems in energy, in the environment, in climate change, in these things. In 1970, now, you can take a look at the talk. And, uh, and order, that's 40 yeah. years ago. <laughs> and I said, we, if we don't solve those things, then we have problems. Yeah. Uh, well, 
you know what? We didn't solve them. Yeah. And so we have problems. Yeah. And so I, especially here in Hawaii, am desperately concerned about our heavy dependence upon uh, imported oil. And I support all of the attempts to get uh, us off of oil, but they're just not enough, in my opinion. And so uh, since I deal with alternative futures and not predicting the future, I am spending more time now trying to help people imagine a collapse in which Hawaii has to become self-sufficient. And so my students and I have spent quite some time making that a good future. That is to say, if it happens, what's the alternative the best of future? It? And Not one the future of the we would want. I, there like are some people who do, but I certainly don't want it. It's Charles Dickens. It's the ghost of Christmas future. The ghost of the ghost of the alternative future. <laughs> That's right. But I'm afraid. You see, I don't want it to be viewed as a catastrophe or as negative. If it's going to happen, then we have to make the best of it. I, in general, say that our job is to help people surf tsunamis. Now, tsunamis are probably not surfable, but if they're coming and we're ignoring them, then the only attitude we can do is uh, turn around Understood. and face them and enjoy them. And so that's my, my perspective. Here. But, but let, me, let me get your analysis on it. So, I mean, there's a lot of people out there. The press is full of hopeful expectations about meeting Linda Lingle's standards right. and getting off oil in, in short order. And the press is all also full of anecdotal stories about how we're doing this and we're doing that. And there's a, a project here and a project there. And this government uh, official has been successful in this anecdotal thing or that. Um, your analysis is that's not moving fast enough. Not moving fast enough. The current goal is 70% by 2030. And we need to have 100%, <laughs> uh, or at least as close to 100% as we can get well before 2030. And the, the problem is that uh, it takes energy to produce energy. Uh, in the peak oil idea, there is a lot of oil left, but uh, it's dwindling. And as it dwindles, it becomes more and more expensive. Uh, demand will go up uh, globally, worldwide, as China and India and these guys demand more. So if the economy recovers, then the price of oil goes way up. Sure. And, uh, and if, as long as it doesn't, that, as it's not right now, bad economy, not much uh, demand of oil. But we're not using money to look for alternatives to oil in the meantime. So the speed, the speed at which the, the, the loss of, of enough oil is happening uh, that speed is faster than our speed in catching up. That's exactly the problem. So what, what could we do to catch up? I mean, in an ideal well, analysis. Uh, well, it, it's I, it's got to be more than ideal, in my opinion. We have to do it. We have to, first of all, uh, look hard at the issue of, of peak oil. I was not a peak oil advocate until some people who are experts in the community, they, they earn their living as a, a geologist working in this field. Um, called my attention to the, the facts and figures, and I looked at them and said, well, even if it's not 100% certain, uh, we don't ever uh, conduct our lives on 100% certainty. Uh, we have, we, we fought against the godless empire of the Soviet Union, and they never attacked us. They just collapsed one day, and yet we spent trillions of dollars preparing for something that never we happened. should have had a good futurist involved, and we well, could have avoided spending that money. And, uh, well, actually, that's another story, and I'd be happy to talk to you about it, because I happen to be president of an organization, the World Future Studies Federation, that took me to all communist countries in the 1980s because they wanted a different future than the, communism. The Stasi was still alive. At that time. They were. And I came back and tried to tell folks, oh, data, they're just <laughs> fooling, you know, it's not happening. So um, it, it's, it's a, a, a problem that people need to address. And I think that uh, we have to first of all say, okay, the experts say that it's, it's sufficiently likely and uh, if, if we look at the information, then we ought to at least begin to prepare for it for a little more urgency than we are now. If it turns out we're wrong, no harm done. Right. If we turns out we're right well, and we ignore it. You have to take a conservative it. position when you're dealing with world, world risks like this. That's right. That's so, exactly but it. But now, I, when you talk about energy and talk about oil, are you really... Are you uh, talking about science and technology? Because that's what we yes, started here. I am. Tell it, me the relation. Well, it's it's a it's a question. Well, all of the uh, development we've had 
let me put it back this way. Uh, we only discovered oil as a resource uh, a little over 100 years ago. We've gone through at least half of it in that 100 years. That oil has fueled everything that is uh, characteristic of modern society. It uh, fueled population growth, it fueled the growth of cities, of automobiles, of globalization, um, of all the technology. Without that oil, we would not be in the world that we're living in We would in not now. have the science and technology that we Exactly have. the point. Uh, or we might have the science, but we wouldn't have the technology in any event. Okay. We wouldn't be able to apply it that way. Right. And therefore, if we want to keep that technology developing, we need to find alternatives to the oil. And that's what we had time to do 40 years ago. And here in Hawaii and around the world, when the so-called Arab oil crisis occurred, we devoted a lot of time to conservation, which would be the number one thing we do, uh, and to uh, looking for alternative energy sources. That's where the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute was created. Uh, work was done on OTEC and solar and wind and all of those I, things. I've heard that the, the, uh, that the, the liturgy is the same today it as is. it was in the 70s. It is. That's one of the most depressing <laughs> things about it. Yeah. It's exactly the same liturgy. We're doomed to repeat ourselves <laughs> but, that night. But not at it. Sisyphus. You know? This is the last. Now this is the last time we have reached the top of that hill, or we've reached the bottom of it, uh, because uh, unless by some miracle, and boy, I spend my time looking for that miracle, we come in with a net energy um, a producer that uh, can quickly retrofit to work with our oil fuel system. I uh, think times are going to be tough, especially well, for us here in Hawaii. Let's talk about that. You know, I mean, when we have a, a power failure, you know, you begin to understand right. the profound effect on every minute of your life and on the minute of the life of everybody on the block and right. in the community. Um, so what is your alternative, your alternative future for a, a world without sufficient oil? Well, and it depends uh, to some extent on whether we have prepared for it at all. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, it, it depends partly on whether it is catastrophically quick or whether it's a slow decline. Obviously, a slow decline is preferable in the sense that we can begin to adjust to it because we do adjust. I mean, as when the economy collapsed, the, the financial uh, fiasco called the global economic system, mm -hmm. uh, people adjusted uh, and people now won't buy. They may have the money, but they're not going to buy. Very quickly change from super consumers to sort of modest uh, conservers. Uh, so the people can change uh, when in reality uh, faces. But if it's uh, catastrophically quick, then things will probably not be but That's the close. thing, you know, you, you can, I agree that, that ideally it would be nice and slow and we could sort of uh, design our future around that. Um, but more likely, things happen I, I quickly, think you're, overnight. You're, you're you don't, it right. sneak up, sneaks up on you. Right. You know? It sneaks up on you, but in this instance, it need not, because we uh, are able to begin to think about it. There was an article by, I think, uh, I forget uh, who it was, but in Honolulu Magazine a number of years ago, uh, not that many, but a few, two or three years ago, in which uh, the, the editor uh, had an editorial about lack of oil and what that would do. Now, I haven't seen that run again, but I wish uh, people would begin to talk about it so that we'll begin to think about it. And then when something does happen, we are able to adjust more quickly and accept it more readily. The example here is that uh, when the Arab oil crisis happened in 74, 75, people were prepared for it mentally because all of the environmental stuff that had been going on before. And they said, oh, this is what it's going to be like. We'd better begin to uh, behave very differently. Uh, and so from that point on through the end of the 70s, we were expecting uh, doom. And then suddenly the price of oil went way down. We, we've been so lucky. I don't want to talk about the economy in a minute, too. Okay. We've been so lucky. You know, my mother used to say to me, wonderful that you were born in this country, that, you know, you have all these opportunities and life is great. 
Um, but you know, you one cannot assume that that will last forever. That is in the human condition. True. Anything like that, you know, could stop. Nothing is forever. <laughs> Nothing is forever. So, so in my worst case scenario, call it an alternative future, a future where oil disappears suddenly, where I wake up in the morning and my clock doesn't, my alarm doesn't go off because there's no power and nothing <laughs> works. Because you know, I've, I've totally everything I do right. dependent on power. What happens? You know, you know, it would seem the, the the logical, easy answer to that question is we're back in the Stone Age. Yes. Everything collapses. If we're unprepared, we are absolutely back in the Stone Age. If that happens, um, I think that, well, we in Hawaii are, first of all, m much more vulnerable than anybody on the mainland because we are in this tiny little isolated place. Uh, disastrously dependent upon imported oil and imported everything. Uh, our economy is entirely based upon the, the global system working. And when that system doesn't work, then we are in very serious trouble. So we need to begin educating young people to know how to farm, to be willing to cooperate. So I've worked, I've spent a lot of time with churches, with rotary clubs, with uh, labor unions, with people who have vested interests in this place, and to say you need to begin developing these skills uh, as well as the high-tech skills. And so I'm working with, with architects at the University of Hawaii and some uh, people that have uh, elementary and secondary schools trying to combine high tech with uh, basic survival skills uh, so that the people are ready for whichever future <laughs> eventually. I, you know, when you have a, a million people on this little island and you have to learn those skills right away, I mean, maybe that you didn't prepare for, I, I, that would be hard. <laughs> well, I think first of all, you're you're going to have to get rid of about half a million or yeah, right. or it's, two thirds of that them. That could happen in, in a very negative way. Yeah, a very <laughs> negative way, and I would imagine many people who don't have uh, a, as vested an interest in this place as I do, and will get away if they possibly can. Although that may not be very easy, and uh, while. I think a case can be made that when Captain Cook showed up, there were probably a million people living here. Uh, the living wasn't easy. They were working extremely hard, and we clearly had overextended the natural ability of the uh, earth to produce because we had aquaculture, we had fish farms, we took soil and put them out in the tidal flats to grow more taro, and it was sort of a slave labor system. Mm -hmm. uh, and a million people were fed. But yeah, it, so it was really a survival thing, and, yes. and maybe that sort of cultural point of survival still exists. This was level. the point that I actually was getting to. I'd rather be here than anywhere else because of the culture. Even if you have to work at survival. Well, we'll have to do it wherever we are. I'll but meet I think you in we're, the field. Jim. We're more cooperative here. <laughs> have you been watching Colbert pretending he is a uh, Mexican immigrant uh, working in the fields? It ain't easy. No. <laughs> now let's assume for a minute that, that, that we have a, a continuum you know, one of your choices, your four mm -hmm. choices, uh, the choice of everything continues right. without without a whole lot of disruption. Right. Uh, so you effectively take that out as a, as a vector that might, you know... Since that to. is the dominant view of the future now, I don't need to promote it. Okay. That's what's in everyone's mind. Right. So I then focus right. on the other. We're not saying it's there. right, but, we're, but for this analysis, we're just it's, taking it out of the analysis. That's correct. That's correct. So what about the economy of the state of Hawaii? Uh, what what's your analysis on that? Are we okay? I mean, we have all kinds of factors, uh, not necessarily oil, not necessarily tech, um, that sort of have to get considered in figuring out where we're going here. What no, do I don't think we're okay, and we just made a decision um, yesterday to uh, take out of uh, agricultural production and put in saw that. housing, uh, a per area that should have stayed in ag land. Uh, and uh, in general, there's, there's a lot of things that we need to do, and one of which is certainly preserve good agricultural land now, and secondly, to encourage people who do want to be farmers, and there are people that do, to encourage them to learn those skills, we need to subsidize their, their labor and their work so that they can have a decent living too, because in a way they are the people that will enable all of us to survive in the future. So 
we need to subsidize their, their way of life and so forth. So you link our agriculture, our prospects I, in agriculture. I say that's our most success. Our most important one at the present time. We need to be able to feed ourselves, and of course we cannot. Uh, th there are various uh, statements I hear, but basically five days worth of food is what I hear. So that uh, there are so many, uh, most people have forgotten what dock strikes are like, but uh, I remember, and it's not just a question of toilet paper and spam. <laughs> Those are the two things that everyone goes gets, but there are a lot of other things, and water and all the rest. So uh, I, I really think that beginning to focus more on agriculture and sustainability and cooperation so that we don't kill each other. I, I'm very unhappy when I read uh, that gun sales have gone up. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make me feel good. No, not at all. And people are having thoughts, you know, that suggest they're they're a little paranoid about the future. That's right. And sometimes paranoids have real enemies. <laughs> they <laughs> do indeed. Uh, and and I just think that we that the uh, that the Ohana concept and all the rest really are still alive here and will have tremendously important. But you meaning. haven't mentioned tourism. Well, because there will be no tourism to mention. <laughs> yeah, that's what under, I surmise. Under yeah, this. Yeah. Uh, there, you know, one can imagine after the collapse, and that's one of the things I spend a lot of time looking at. If we prepared properly, then what can we have after the collapse? And so I can imagine sort of a return to the days when if you're super rich and had lots of time, you could come on some sailboat, uh, as they used to here, so a, a sort of elite tourism, because this still will be a wonderful place to live uh, and visit, will, will still happen. But mass tourism, uh, I, I just don't see any way to get airplanes to fly on anything other than, than petroleum, essentially, in the, the foreseeable future. In fact, one of the most interesting things is when I first became a futurist, the big developments were in transportation. We had gone from, uh, from sailing boats to steamboats to propeller airplanes to jet airplanes uh, and to the 747. We'd gone to the moon and back, tremendous developments. There was a meeting at the East-West Center in 1971, I guess, of communication experts. And they all said, there won't be any new developments in communication technology. Sure. <laughs> I, I was stunned and I suggested so, there might so be We'll some. never need drives more than 10 <laughs> megabytes. <laughs> right. and, and, that's, and what's happened is there has been no further developments in transportation, but we've had tremendous changes in communication. So maybe it's time for transportation to develop again, but I'm, I'm looking for those emerging issues and I don't see it in the transportation area. What an know. exciting thing it is to be a futurist, you know. But, I, you know, uh, just hearing you go through these analysis, uh, it's complicated, yes, uh, it's true. dynamic, it's always changing. You could make mm -hmm. a different analysis every day. And, 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 <laughs> I do. <laughs> I'm sure you do. And, and what's, what's interesting, and I'll leave you with this thought, see if you have a reaction to it. If you're a futurist, the past looks better all the time. You know, I, I agree with that 100%, and I say, is that just because I'm approaching the end of my life and look back, or, or is it really objectively so? Uh, I, I want, I teach, I'm, I'm around young people all the time, and it's their future I'm talking about, not mine. And they have a positive can-do attitude. They are completely aware of all the bad things but their future is going to be a good future. I think people in what we call the Dark Ages didn't call it the Dark Ages. Right, yeah. They call it my world. Yeah. And so that I, I think it's important that we older folks not discourage the young people from having a positive attitude, but a realistic attitude uh, of surfing tsunamis. I hope they're right. I hope all that uh, <laughs> the optimism comes through and it works. I hope so too. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Okay, great thanks a lot, We'll do it again. Okay, okay great. Thanks <laughs> so much. <laughs>